Good morning, it's great to have you join me as we take another walk in the woods. We're back here at Independence Oaks County Park and well we all know that there are more than just oak trees here at this park. In fact there's trees of every variety it seems like, maple and elm and beech and birch and well this morning we thought it would be fun to see how well you know your trees and to test your knowledge of dendrology. So what we're going to do is we're going to show you a picture of a leaf, tell you a little bit about that tree and see if you can identify it. So here's our first tree. This tree grows only in the northern hemisphere. It's the oldest tree that we have here in the United States. In fact, out in Nevada, we believe the trees there are up to 5,000 years old. It is the pine tree. Our second tree is known for its fruit, usually green and black, but it also grows in shades of pink and purple and brown. It's used for oils and actually, in days of old was combined with charcoal to be used as eyeshadow. Its branches are also the international symbol of peace. It would be the olive tree. This tree was known for construction, especially in Bible times. It was Solomon's favorite, but it also was used by Egyptians. They would use it when they would mummify dead bodies. And North American Indians would actually use it as a mosquito repellent. Today, it's used often in closets or in dressers because its wood is repellent of insects. It would be the cedar tree. This tree only grows at the top every year. And through the top, it pushes out what's called a whorl, which is a round ring of branches. And as the tree grows every year, it adds a new whorl. And you can actually tell how old this tree is by counting the number of whorls up from the bottom. It would be a fir tree. This last tree was often used in the past as shipbuilding. Today it's used uh, for perfumes, taking extracts from the flower. Its sap is used for tanning leather, and its gum is used for thickening soft drinks. It is the acacia tree. Now I have one last question, and it's this. What do all these trees have in common? The answer, they all appear together in a very unusual place. And we read about it in Isaiah chapter 41. So I invite you to turn with me there as we take this walk in the woods. Turn myself on there. So how many got all five? You were feeling good up there till that last one, weren't you? And then we snuck that one in on you. But there's a reason for that, and we'll get to that in just a minute. So... I want to talk to you this morning about a problem, and it's a problem that's a pretty significant problem in our world, and it's a problem that maybe a lot of you aren't that used to, so, and I'm going to ask you wherever you are to turn me down a little bit, because I'm getting a ton of reverb back up here, that'll help me out a little bit, but this problem is strange in that we're not even aware of it, and yet it somehow connects and affects uh, many of us, maybe not all of us, but the problem is what's known as desertification. Desertification. And maybe that's not familiar to you, but here's what it is, and this is the official definition. It's land degradation in which biological productivity is lost due to natural processes or induced by human activities whereby fertile areas become increasingly more arid. In other words, it's land that loses its productivity and returns to an arid state. And so it's land that becomes desert, whether it was before or not, it now is desert and it's not useful for growing plants and as a result it's not useful for sustaining any type of animal life or human life. Now, that doesn't sound like a particular problem to any of us who are sitting here in Michigan. I'm not aware of anywhere in our state that desertification is affecting our land and our soil. And yet I think it has overtones because it applies to where many of us are living in our spiritual lives. Sometimes the fertile land of our heart becomes dry and dusty and arid. And sometimes we find ourselves dealing with spiritual dryness or spiritual desertification. So that's what I want to talk about this morning here. How do we get there? What's the cause of it? What do we do with it? And how in the world do we get out of that? 
Well, desertification, I would describe it this way in our spiritual lives. It's when we just kind of feel dull and bored with what used to be exciting and, and adventurous in the stale and the monotonous and the mundane has, has overtaken us. It's where when we get into God's word and we read it, we get all done. And it's like, yeah, I didn't really get anything out of that. Or it's when we stop and we pray. And about halfway through, we're like, why am I even doing this? Because this prayer is going nowhere. And we feel ourselves really, really distant from God. Like, yeah, we know he's there, but he's way off there in the distance. And we show up for church because that's what we always do. But we don't find a lot of excitement or energy or, or passion. We might show up even at our ministry or volunteer opportunities, but we just kind of go through the motions of it because we've just lost the enthusiasm and we've lost the excitement. And if we're completely honest, if we talk about what's going on inside of us, we just kind of feel dry and, and dusty and, and really, really parched. Well, one person said it this way, the desert is the soul without the sense of God's presence. And it's not really all that uncommon. And maybe you find yourself there this morning. If you're completely honest, if we did this little thumbs up, whatever like that, you'd be like, that's me, spiritually. And I, I'm here, I care. But if I'm completely honest, I, there's something missing and, and there's something that, that I'd like to have. And I'm trying. But it's just like, I don't know. Well, there's several reasons why we find ourselves in these desert places in our lives, and I think they're all legit. The first reason is sometimes because of us. We've neglected maybe some of the spiritual practices that, that kind of keep us pumped up spiritually, or we've ignored the, the work of the Holy Spirit, what he's doing in our lives, and we've been off following our own agenda, or we filled our lives with a lot of things, or, and we've kind of pushed God to the background there. Not that we've forgotten about him, but he just hasn't been the priority that he used to be. Sometimes it's because we're dealing with sin issues. And it's like, well, I'm going to do what I want to do. And, and, and we've backed off from God. And as a, as a result, we sense that he's backed off from us. But sometimes that dryness that we experience, if we're completely honest, we know that it's us. But sometimes it's like, I don't think it's me. I mean, I'm trying to do all this stuff. I'm, I'm trying to be plugged in spiritually. I'm trying to connect with God. I'm trying to, you know, do all these spiritual disciplines that I've been taught to do. But sometimes I think, secondly, life is at fault. And we could put into situations that just suck the energy out of us and, and, and turn us dry. And we're, because we're all interconnected beings, sometimes we'll be going through an emotional situation and it just kind of sucks everything out of us emotionally. But then we draw from our spiritual as well. I think for a lot of us, even dealing with a lot of the uh, coronavirus stuff, has led to dryness because it sucked a lot out of us. This has been hard. And if it's been easy for you, I applaud you. It's been hard for me and for my family. I think even as a church, it's been hard. But sometimes life has a way of, of taking it out of you. The demands at work, something that's going on with your family, and it feels like you're just putting out, putting out, putting out, putting out, and nothing's coming in, and as a result, you feel very dry. And so sometimes life is at fault. But then thirdly, I think sometimes God is at fault. And I, I use the word fault there reservedly. But sometimes God brings dryness into our stories. Think about the children of Israel. When they left Egypt, where did God take them? Right through the wilderness. And they weren't but a couple days into it. And what was the problem that they had? There was no water. And yet they were right exactly where God had brought them. Think, think about Jesus. He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness a place of dryness and there are times in our lives when dryness is because of God and not because of us and I wanted to mention that this morning because sometimes like what's wrong with me maybe there's nothing wrong with you maybe God's up to something in your story and he's just setting you up and that may be the case right now in your story but what's the solution when we face dryness, what do we do with it? Well, in the natural world, if we're talking about desertification, there's a couple different approaches. The first thing is prevention. If we want to keep land from turning into desert, then we have to be really careful about how we treat the land. We want to make sure that we don't overgraze it. We want to make sure that we don't 
plant the same thing over and over again and strip the soil of its nutrients. And so prevention is important. I think that probably has spiritual overtones too. That we can prevent going there sometimes by making sure that we're staying plugged in spiritually. But you would think the second thing then would be irrigation. Let's get water to those places. But that's actually the wrong answer, believe it or not. Because if we send water to these places of dryness without creating a system where the soil can retain it, that water just goes right through and actually leads to erosion. It can further damage the environment. Crazy, right? So what is the answer? The answer is to actually, you knew this was coming, to plant trees. And the answer to desertification is to introduce trees because trees protect the soil from wind and water erosion and can return the land to some sort of, of, of vegetation. I read an interesting story this week about a 67-year-old woman. I think we have a picture over here. Oh, I don't. Sorry. Oh, there she is. Oh, I'm sorry about that. There we go. Um, she lives in northern China, and she is working by herself, basically, to re- whatever, repopulate the vegetation of northern Mongolia there. But she has, in the last 12 years, she has planted over 2 million trees by herself. And uh, it's all, there's a story behind it. Her son had gone to university, had, had really wanted to do this for a career, and then got sick and passed away. And so her thing is, this is how she's uh, going to honor his memory. And she has made this her life mission to actually go out and plant these trees. Crazy story. But there's a story, too, that I want to look at right there in, in Isaiah chapter 41. We mentioned it on the video, and if you haven't turned there yet, I want to encourage you to do that this morning. Let me give you a little background on Isaiah. Isaiah was a prophet, and he uh, was an Old Testament, was one of these guys who spoke to the, during the time of the kings of Israel. Probably the most prolific prophet. Um, the first book of our prophets is Isaiah. He spoke to Judah and also a little bit to Israel and some of the surrounding nations. But prophets in those days did two things. They spoke for God. And in Isaiah's case, he spoke a lot of warnings of God's judgments to come. But then they also prophesied of the future. And Isaiah did the same thing. In fact, the book of Isaiah probably contains more messianic prophecies about Jesus than any other of the prophets. But Isaiah spoke in that day to the Jews to say, hey, let me warn you about what's coming. Now, I think this is interesting, too. Isaiah was married. He had two kids. One of his kids' names was Meher Shalahashbath, our longest, longest name in the uh, Bible of any person. So if you're pregnant right now and thinking of a name, that is not the name, all right? So uh, that your kid would spell it for the rest of his life every place he ever went. But he was married to a prophetess. And we don't have any record of what Isaiah's wife prophesied. We don't even know her name. But evidently she was like a partner in ministry. And, and the two of them spoke for God there in Israel. If you take the book of Isaiah, the first 39 chapters are pretty negative. Because it's, it's God's judgments and God's warnings against Israel's of judgments to come. And then the whole tenor of the book changes in chapter 40, and it talks about God's restoration and God's redemption. So God says, hey, if you don't change, these judgments are going to come. But then after those judgments come, and they did come, I'm going to restore Israel and Judah, and I'm going to change things, and I'm going to redeem the story here. And so as we get to Isaiah chapter 41, we're in the second half of the book, which is good news. This is meant to be hope for the people to whom it's written, and it's meant to be hope for us today. And so let's read it here, starting in verse number 17. The poor and needy search for water, but there is none. Their tongues are parched with thirst. They are in a desert place. Maybe literally, definitely figuratively, God's talking about people who are experiencing spiritual dryness and dryness of soul. But then he says this, I, the Lord, will answer them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will make rivers flow on barren heights and springs within the valleys. I will turn the desert into pools of water and the parched ground into springs. And this is where it gets really good. 
I will put in the desert the cedar and the acacia, the myrtle and the olive. I will set pines in the wasteland, the fir and the cypress together. I'm going to plant a forest in the desert, is what he's saying here. And it's going to be a different place from now on. And then he finishes by saying this, so that the people may see and know, may consider and understand that the hand of the Lord has done this, that the Holy One of Israel has created it. And so let me just make a couple observations here this morning, mention a few lessons, and then talk about what we do when we find ourselves in this dry place. First observation is we don't know exactly to whom this was written or for what, uh, 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 sorry, we do know to whom this was written, but we don't know for whom it was written. Okay, let me explain that. It was written to the people in Judah that time, and maybe it was just specifically to say to them, you're going to go into captivity, but when you're in captivity, it's going to feel very dry and desert-like, but it's going to be okay because I'm still going to bring streams and trees into your story. That's a possibility. It may have been written to the people or for the people that will be leaving captivity to say, you know what, you're going to be going through a desert place again. Interesting. When the children of Israel came up out of Egypt into the promised land, originally they came through desert. When they came back from Babylon, they had to come through desert again. And so maybe this was God saying to the people to come, you're going to be experiencing, you'll have what you need as you come back. It could be that it's just meant for people in general. And that would include us even today to say, you know what, when you get in the dry places in your life, there's going to be streams, there's going to be trees, I'm going to take care of you. And there's also the possibility that it was meant for the future, the millennial kingdom that hasn't even come yet. That God's saying when Jesus comes and sets up his throne here after the second coming, that this place that's always been barren is going to be lush and it's going to be bear fruit, and, and, and it's going to be a, a place of abundance. And probably all of those are fair. And maybe the answer is all of the above, but this is written certainly for us today to say, hey, you know what? If we're experiencing barrenness and dryness and if we're parched, there can be hope for our stories. Now, obviously, the idea of dryness is emphasized in this passage. It talks about desert, barren, parched wasteland. But the passage is also alive with hope. It talks about springs in the valley, pools of water in the wasteland. And it's a passage that says, you know what, whatever it is right now, that dryness, it doesn't have to stay that way. In fact, it's not going to stay that way. Now, what I think is interesting, though, is that it doesn't just stop with those streams. We talked about that already, but he says, we're going to send stream. I'm going to send streams, but I'm also going to plant trees. And not just a tree, but a whole grove of trees. And if you look, if you lived in Babylon, these trees were not necessarily native to Babylon. These were trees that were native to Palestine. And so anybody in the olden days who were, was hearing that passage or reading that passage would realize that God is taking them back to the place where they'd been, back to Palestine. But all of those trees represent this idea that it's not just going to be for now. It's going to be continued. And the trees talk about continuation. And then the passage actually tells us there in verse number 20 that the trees are designed to get attention. Into where you'd walk into that place and go, oh, well, I wasn't expecting to see a tree there. Back a little over a year ago, my wife and I went out to see our daughter, Allie, out in uh, California, and uh, we went to Palm Springs area and uh, went to a Indian reservation. They have a um, canyon uh, there that you can go explore, and, and it's desert out there, and it's hot, and it's uh, really hot, actually. And so we went there, and we got to this um, canyon, and uh, we're walking along, and all of a sudden you come over this hill, and you're out in this desert, and there's like palm trees everywhere. And it kind of catches you by surprise. You're like, oh, I wasn't expecting that. And I still remember that shock of seeing these palm trees. But that's what God's saying, too. Sometimes in the dryness, God's going to, to bring these trees in this vegetation, and it's going to be like, oh. And everybody's going to notice, and it's going to stick out. And that's the point that he's making here. Now, the lessons from this, though, I think are where it gets important. The first lesson is this, that God uses deserts to create thirst. God uses deserts to create thirst. 
if you're going through a thirsty, dry spell in your life, that's God. And maybe it's because of what you've done that's not been right, and God's saying, hey, let me get your attention here, and let me create some thirst. Or maybe everything's fine, but God's getting ready for something bigger in your story, and he's like, you know what, we're going to just send some dryness right now to set you up to get you really, really thirsty for what I'm up to in your story. And so if you're thirsty right now, God is using your desert to get you thirsty. Second thing here, dryness may be an indication that God is up to something. That was, we mentioned it before, in the story of the Israelites, God was up to something in the wilderness. In the story of Jesus, God was up to something in the wilderness. You can look at the story of Moses. He was out in the desert, but God was up to something. You can even look at the story of Paul later on. After he trusts Christ, God sends him out to the desert for three years because he's up to something. And if you're experiencing dryness in your life, take some encouragement because it may be that God is using this as a moment of transformation in your life. And you're frustrated by it and, 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 and you can't get out of it and you're like, I can't find God in this. And God's like, no, that's okay. Because I'm up to something right now. I know it feels dry, but we're not done yet with your story. Here's the third thing. God is totally aware of where you are and what your needs are. Look again at verse number 17. The poor and needy search for water, but there is none. God knows that. He's the one speaking here. He says, I see them searching for water. I see them parched with thirst, and I will answer them. I will not forsake them. And if you're experiencing that dryness this morning, God knows. He gets it. He sees how thirsty you are. And when the time's right, he's going to do something about it because he is engaged in your story. And I think sometimes when we're in dryness, it's so frustrating. It's like, I can't find God. I don't know what to do here. God can find you. And that's what you need to know this morning. Another observation here is that God can turn your desert into streams in the forest. That's awesome, isn't it? Because whatever it is right now, it doesn't have to stay that way. And it's probably not even God's intention to leave it that way. God's got something coming still. So what is the solution for spiritual dryness? How do we get past this? Well, if we look at the passage, we're told that God sends streams and that God plants trees. And that's interesting to me because God sends streams and God plants trees. I can't send streams into my story and I can't plant trees into my stories. So what is it that I can do? Is there anything or do I just need to sit and wait? Well, if we go back to verse number 17, I think there's a clue here. I think something that can be super helpful to us even this week. And it says there towards the end of the verse, it says, but the Lord will answer them. He will answer them, what just happened? I would assume that the people have been crying out to him. And the people have been praying and expressing their need and their thirst. And God says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to answer them. So I think as we look at this on a very practical level, what can we do when we're dealing with dryness? We can start asking God. We can start asking God, I think, several different things here. So let me just mention five things. First of all, we can ask God, why? Why am I experiencing this period of dryness? Am I experiencing this? So God, please show me. If it's because there's sin in my life or it's because I've, I've gotten away from, from following you passionately, well, then I need to deal with that. But, but God, please show that to me. And maybe when we start saying, God, show me why, we don't come up with anything like that. Sin in our life or sin in our story. But we start to sense that God's up to something. But I think this is a fair question for us. To ask God why. And the key idea here is to get perspective. Dryness may be part of God's discipline. Dryness may be part of God's work in your story. But it allows us to step back from us and to get some perspective. Second thing that we can ask is we can ask God for mercy. And I would add to that, ask God for mercy and for grace. If it's a sin issue that I'm dealing with, then I need God's mercy in my story. If it's an issue where... As near as I can tell, spiritually we're doing okay, I just have to wait. Then I need God's grace in my story to give me the strength and the endurance to keep on going even through this dryness. But the key idea here is preparation. I want to 
ask God for mercy and I want to ask God for grace because it's part of me realizing that God is setting me up for something here in the future. Third thing that we can ask God for is we can ask God for strength. And that's for the now. That's for the needs that you have right here on Sunday morning. That's for the things that you're going to be facing this week. Because we need water when we're parched. We need water. We need streams. And we need God sometimes in our story to bring us what we are missing. I want to read this passage one more time. Because there's something in here that we maybe read through the first time without noticing. But let me read it again and you'll pick it up. Verse number 17, the poor and needy search for water but there is none. Their tongues are parched with thirst, but I, the Lord, will answer them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will make rivers flow on barren heights and springs within the valleys. I will turn the desert into pools of water and the parched ground into springs. I will put in the desert these trees. I will set pines in the wasteland so that the people may see and know and consider and understand that the Lord or the hand of the Lord has done this. Do you catch that over and over again? I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. This is a promise. And that's really the key idea here as we look at this, asking for streams, is to lean into God's promises and say, God, you say that you will. I need you to right now. Fourth thing here, we can ask God for trees. And trees represent not just the now, but trees represent represent the, the continuation, or I use the word here, the perpetuation, where we say to God, okay, I'm experiencing dryness, but God, I need a new season in my life. I need trees. I, I need to feel your blessing. I need to feel the warmth of your face on my life, because sometimes we feel really dark and really cold. But to say, and this is, this is, God, and this is God's offer in this passage, is to give us trees, not just water, but trees. To say, okay, yeah, I'll take care of your needs today, but I've got more for tomorrow and for the next day and for the next day and for the next day. And maybe we just need to step back and say, God, I need some assurance here because I need some trees in my life. We can ask God for trees. And then finally, we can ask God for awareness. This passage in, in Isaiah 41, there, there's another verse in, in this chapter that's probably more popular and well-known than these verses that we just read. But they fit totally in context with, with what this story is. And so I want to read this right now. Isaiah 41, 10 says this. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you by my righteous right hand. And this awareness that we're looking for is to be aware of God's presence. Because here's the truth. When you're in the desert, you're not alone. Not only does God see you, which we already read about, in verse number 10, what does he say? I am with you. And when you're feeling spiritually dry, when you're feeling spiritually cut off from God, it's actually somewhat of a lie. Especially if you look at your life and say, I don't think there's anything here spiritually where, you know, I'm pursuing self or, or ignoring the Holy Spirit or whatever. And I think sometimes the enemy comes and says, see, God's not paying attention to you. And God's saying, oh, no, no, no. We're dealing with dryness here. We're not dealing with abandonment. I am right there in this with you. And so this morning, maybe you're dealing with desertification. It's a real threat in our natural world, but it's a real threat in our spiritual lives as well. And maybe you're there right now. But let me just say this, there's hope. Maybe God's using this as a time to get your attention. Maybe it's time to say, you know what, part of this is my fault. Because I have neglected really being, you know, pursuing God as I should. Or maybe you look at this and say, man, life is just beating me up right now. Or maybe you even look at this and say, I don't know, but maybe I'm just kind of sensing that God's up to something. But there is hope for your story if you're dealing with dryness. And so what do we do? I think we need to start asking. Asking why? Asking for mercy and grace, asking for streams, asking for trees, and asking for the awareness of his presence. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word, for how it speaks into our stories of where we are. And I know in my own story, so many times dryness would be the word that would describe it. And I feel like I'm trying, but it's just not working. And 
calling out and I'm not hearing an answer and trying to dive into your word and just not really find anything there. And that can be so frustrating. And I'm sure that's true for other people that are sitting here this morning. But for every person who's in this place, I pray that you would give us insight into what's going on in our story. And if it's because of a place where we're not doing right or we're ignoring your spirit or, or just not prioritizing your word or prayer or that relationship, I pray that you convict us and, and pull us back to you. And for the person whose story is just hard right now and life is beating them up and has them distracted or distressed, I pray that you provide encouragement. But God, I pray that you would do something in this season, send us strength. Do something in the, in, in the season to come to in sending us truth. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Two questions this morning. First of all, where are you? Are you dry? What question do you need to be asking? Maybe you don't even have a relationship with God. That's where it all starts. Of course you're going to be dry. There's, there's no connection to this source of streams or the source of trees. That connection comes through Jesus Christ, who gave his life for us, died, buried, rose again, so that we could find forgiveness of sins, so we could find freedom, so we could find the hope of eternity with God, and so we could find that relationship restored with him. And you just need to simply put your faith and trust in him. And I invite you to do that this morning. God, we're grateful for your word, for how it speaks to us where we are, even in our dryness, and for the encouragement it gives us. Thanks for loving us the way that you do and speaking into our story. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.
And with great anticipation, we await the promise to come. Everything that you've spoken will come to pass. Let it be done. We receive. Amen. May you be blessed this week. Go in grace and peace. We'll see you again soon.